Well, we have been working phrase by phrase through what is perhaps the most well-known scripture in all the world, the 23rd Psalm. And we're calling this message series A Vision for Life because we think that is exactly what Psalm 23 can give us, a vision for life, a way to see life, a way to be in the world. A way that can fill us with hope and meaning and purpose. And so we saw in the middle of Psalm 23 that it declares about God that he restores my soul. So if that's true, what's the implication? That my soul needs restoring. Now, we don't really like to hear that kind of thing. We like to think, you know, let's, let's solve problems. Let's get them done once and over. Let's fix it. So if the faucet is leaky, we replace the faucet. It's done. I can move on to the next thing. But when you're talking about any kind of life, including yours, it's never over and done. It's always ongoing processes. It's not like I can say, Oh, well, you know, I ate uh, four weeks ago, so I'm good. No, I need to eat and eat and eat in this ongoing process to restore my body. I can't say, oh, yeah, I, I slept five years ago. <laughs> no, I, I need to sleep. Some of you might be sleeping right now. I need to sleep over and over again. I need this process to restore my body. The same thing is true for your soul. Your soul needs restoring. So my question to you this morning as you're sitting here is, do you feel like your soul needs restoring? You know, if that's you, if that's true for you, I would say this. If you feel that way, it's not because you're a loser and it's not because you're not spiritual enough. It's because you share the human condition. And so my prayer is this morning, in some small way, your soul will be restored because one of the primary ways that I know that God does that is through his word. When we come to his word, like the 23rd Psalm, we not only encounter its truth, we encounter his love coming through it to us. And so I have been telling you guys, if you've been with us, that I'm really hoping... Um, also, can someone close the door in the back there? That would be really helpful. I'm really hoping that um, as we go through this, you can actually commit this to memory, that this psalm will become part of your spiritual DNA, that you'd have it memorized. Why? So when that day comes when you're alone, when that day comes when you find yourself in a hospital room, On that day when everything feels like it's falling apart, that you have this in you, that you have this deep vision, this is the big story that I am in, and that you can hold on to the hope that is found here. I just think it's so, so crucial for us. So we're going to begin again today once again by saying out loud, I'm going to ask you to recite out loud with me the phrases we've studied so far as a way of beginning to memorize this. So see if you can do it without looking at the screen. Maybe even see if you can do it with your eyes closed. All right, so here we go. The 23rd Psalm starts, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lay down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. All right. And today we come to the phrase, you prepare a table before me in the presence of of my enemies. What in the world does that mean? Here's one way to interpret it. It's all about spite and revenge. In other words, God has set up a sumptuous meal for me. I'm gnawing on a drumstick while my enemies are starving, looking on, wishing that they could have it. How does it feel? How's it going for you? Some of you are laughing. 
A lot of scholars think that's what this line means. What does it mean? Let's unpack it phrase by phrase and see what we find at the end. It begins with these two words, you prepare. God, you prepare a meal. So two of the primary images of God that we have in scriptures is God as shepherd and God as host. And here we find in the 23rd Psalm, the shepherd host. He is both now, in the ancient Middle East, many of you may know that the etiquette kit was when a stranger arrived at your tent, you were to welcome them. You were to offer them a meal, almost like offer them asylum. Like, anyone who's under my tent, I'm going to look out for. They believed that a person who becomes your guest has been sent by God. Therefore, they viewed hospitality as a sacred duty. This is why Hebrews 13.2 says, Do not forget to entertain strangers. Do not forget to welcome strangers. Be the host. For by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. So strangers arriving at a shepherd's tent at that time were called God's guests. So imagine yourself. Imagine yourself a lonely wanderer in life. For some of you, that's not hard to imagine, is it? Imagine yourself a lonely wanderer in life out in the wilderness when you spy a tent in the distance and you can see there's a fire and you can actually, even from this distance, like smell this amazing food cooking. And even though you don't know them, you, you approach and and you don't know what's going to happen. You're a complete stranger, and yet you are welcomed as a guest by the owner, and the owner is God himself. This is the story of my life. For many of you, too. I was a lonely wanderer in the world, and God welcomed me in. This means that you, you can be a guest of God. Okay, so in a traditional society where some people make a lot of money and some people have no money, who exactly is it that is normally preparing the meals and serving? The servants. And yet, who is preparing the meal here? God himself. So imagine this image. The maker of heaven and earth is stooping down, being the servant, the creator serving the creature. Now, in some religions, this would be considered absolutely blasphemous. Except we remember what was the ultimate revelation of who God actually is and what he's like. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus when God stepped down into space and time and took on flesh and became one of us. And what does Jesus say in Mark 10, verse 45? The Son of Man did not come to serve. I'm sorry, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. To give his life as a ransom for many. Listen to that again. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. So God prepares this meal. So does he prepare the meal and then like, pff, all right, throws us a few scraps? Like, you ought to be glad you get anything. No, he prepares a table for us. You prepare a table. Think about this. God setting a table for you giving you a place setting, welcoming you, like there's a place reserved for you at his table. God is the host, and he's bringing out the best china. Now, why do we bring out the best china? Why do we sometimes really try and make these fancy meals? I think it's when we're trying to communicate two things. The first one is we do it when we want to say, this moment is really important. So think about a wedding reception. What are we doing? We're having this feast as a way of declaring that this moment, what these two people are doing right now, is really important. So the first thing is, it's saying this moment here is really important. But the second thing it's saying is, we invite particular people to come to that wedding reception 
You are important to me. We put out the best china is a way of saying, you are important to me. So think about what God is saying to you in this. God has set out this special meal, and who is this expected important guest? You. You prepare a table before me. Now note, it doesn't say whether or not you actually decide to eat what's put, been put in front of you. Now, some of you have been parents, and you know what this is like. You're tired at the end of the day. You work really hard. You try to make this really good meal for your kids. It's healthy. And you put it down, and they stick their nose. Now, now. It's like, why, I ought to. But, I mean, like, they drive you crazy. If God has set a table for you, are you even attracted to what's on the menu? You might say, well, I guess I am. Of course I am. I mean, it's God. Well, really? If you have grown up on Mountain Dew and Twinkies all your life, what does a really good healthy salad look like to you? It might not even look good. I might be speaking from evidence in my own life. God's food may look a little foreign to you. I don't know what that looks like for you. It might look strange to you. Not what you are used to. Not what you're accustomed to. Listen to what Hebrews 15, 12 says. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So here's a question. Do you have your senses trained to discern good from evil? I don't know about you, but when I look out at the world today, I think a lot of people actually are not able to discern good and evil. You have people calling evil good, and you have people calling good evil. And what it's saying is it actually takes practice to actually get to that kind of understanding. So, is the good, wholesome food of God, his truth, his ways, his values, is all that attractive to you? Or are you honestly, if you're honest, you say, actually, I'm more attracted to junk food. Are your senses trained to discern the difference between good food from God and junk food from our culture? Another way of saying this is I'm asking you spiritually, have you moved beyond a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? God wants us to grow up to the point that we can actually enjoy food that is good for us, that we actually love the taste of things that are good for us. But I have to admit to you, when I was a little kid, I had to learn to eat food that was good before I actually learned to like it. I had to practice it. It took a while to grow to like and delight in food that was good for me. And some of you have heard this before. I'm still working on kale. <laughs> I really am. I'm getting closer. Yesterday I had Brussels sprouts. So I'm, I'm getting there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I, I think it's also true in the spiritual realm, like with spiritual disciplines. If God is calling you to the table of fasting, how attractive does that look to you? If God is calling you to the table of worship, if you're honest, is that does that look attractive to you? Now, we enjoy those things in a different way, in a different plane of, of enjoyment than we enjoy Twinkies and Mountain Dew, right? It's a, it's a, but you have to develop that taste. So I need to pray, Lord, help me to want the good things that you would have for me. Sometimes we pray, oh God, would you give me the good things? I think we need to pray, God, would you help me to even want what is good? Because a lot of times I don't even quite see it. All right, so now we come to the really hard part of this verse. Now we come to this word, enemies. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So there are three major ways that you can understand this verse. And each one of them actually is helpful. Each one of them will turn you to a truth that we find in Scripture. But I only think that one of them is the actual 
intent of the phrase as the author wrote it. So I want you to hear these three and figure out which one you think it is. So here's the first one, what I started with. Some people are really embarrassed by this line. They try and skip over it and smooth it over because they're convinced what it really means is God sets up this beautiful table for me and my enemies are watching from afar, starving while I stuff my face. You see, the difference between the Psalms and us is the Psalms are honest about what they're really feeling. The Psalms contain the theology of our guts. The Psalms say the quiet part out loud. Have you never, ever really wanted to see an enemy punished? To get what they deserve? Have you never wanted someone to get their comeuppance? They had it coming. They're only getting what they deserve. Think about the voices we hear this week in the Middle East and on college campuses. It is very human to want revenge. And the Psalms, at least, are honest about that. They're honest to God. So here's the deal. Even if you can't admit your true feelings to other people, because what would they think of you if they actually knew the thoughts that are in your head? Even if you can't admit the truth to yourself, because if you did, what would that say about what kind of person you are? Can you admit the truth to God? When's the last time you said, God, Lord, this is how I'm actually feeling? And it might mean I'm petty. It might mean I'm small. It might mean I'm bad. It might even mean I, I'm evil. But this is what I'm actually feeling. When you do that, that is not a sign of spiritual immaturity. That is a sign of spiritual maturity. Because a spiritually mature person is a person who's willing to be honest and naked before their maker. That's what it is. Honest and naked before your maker. Okay, so first, to be spiritually healthy, we need to be not in denial about the basis, feelings, and thoughts in our head. But at the same time, we also have to remember that if I'm going to call Jesus Lord, I have to live under his lordship, which means I don't get the right. I have given up the right to take revenge and vengeance and judgment into my own hands. Listen to what Romans 12, 19 says. Do not take revenge, my friends. But leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. You want to get revenge? In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay, so the first understanding of this phrase in the 23rd Psalm is, it's really someone just expressing like, I've been so hurt and wronged by these people. I'm so glad that God, you're giving me this and they're not getting it. But we see that's not in keeping with the teachings of Jesus, but it's true to the human condition. Okay, here's the second one. Imagine you get a gift certificate to your favorite restaurant. I mean, you, it's really fancy. You really love the food. You are so psyched. And someone gives you this gift card. You finally get to the point in your schedule where you can go. You arrive. You're so excited. You're imagining and remembering all that amazing food. You come to the girl at the desk and she says, oh yes, we have your reservation, table number 10. Please follow me. And you're following her and you're so excited. And you go around the corner and there at table number 10 are the two people you can't stand the most waiting for you at your table. So I want you to stop right now and I want you to answer to yourself, who are the two people I can't stand the most? Man, some of you got that answer way too quickly. Now, as long as it wasn't me, I'm cool with that, okay? But think of that. You're so excited. It's going to be the same table, same restaurant, same food. And God wants you to be blessed with the joy of sitting with the two people you can't stand the most to eat this meal together. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. 
This interpretation of the scripture says that what this is about is God is calling you to the table of reconciliation. That if I'm to be a true follower of Jesus, I have to try my best, the best of my abilities to find peace, to strive to be reconciled, or at least to be humane towards my adversaries, towards those who afflict me. We just heard the scripture, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. All right, this interpretation is in complete alignment with the teachings of Jesus. Jesus said, you have heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Man, if this is not supernatural, I don't know what is. Now, obviously, this applies in, when we're talking about war on an individual level. It, it certainly applies to people who are on the opposite end of the political spectrum. And, Will, I'm not just pointing at you like you're the opposite end of my political spectrum. <laughs> All right, it applies to those people who are at the opposite end of the political spectrum to you. But if it applies in those cases, doesn't it most certainly apply to other Christians? There are Christians who totally disagree with you about social issues. They totally disagree with your stance on abortion, on human sexuality, on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But if they are saying, I am trusting Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior, even if you're absolutely convinced that they're wrong on the social issue, what are you doing with them? You see, if they say that, then you need to say, look, we disagree about this, we disagree about that. But you are trying to follow Jesus as best as you know how. And I am trying to follow Jesus as best I know how. And that's got to be good enough. It's got to be good enough. Now, I want to confess to you, when I was a younger Christian, I was coming out of a really decadent, worldly way of living. And so I was like, no, that's evil. And I will have, I will have no part of evil, right? And, and I think when we're, there's times in our lives where we, where we have to do that. Like if you're struggling with alcohol, if you're an alcoholic, you're like, I can't be there. But there's a spiritual maturity here that we got to get to where even if you think that, even if you're like, no, I cannot fellowship with them. I can't abide that because they're wrong. They're absolutely wrong. Is that really what Jesus wants you to do? Are you willing to share the Lord's table with someone with whom you deeply disagree? What I'm claiming to you is if you're not, you do not understand the Lord's table. Peter was a poor, poverty-stricken fisherman. Matthew was a rich tax collector who worked for Rome, who worked for the oppression Simon was a revolutionary zealot who saw Rome as ultimate evil that had to be overturned at all costs. I don't think it's just that they didn't like each other. I think they probably hated each other. I think they looked at them. They're the problem. And Jesus said, and guess what? You three, you're to sit at my table. You three are to find fellowship right here. And you might say, no, no, yeah, but that's different. That's, no, guess who else was invited? Judas. This is what we are called to do. Okay, so, interpretation one, revenge on your enemies. Your right, righteousness displayed as they suffer. Interpretation number two, no, it's a table of reconciliation with your enemies. Both have biblical warrant, but I believe when you look at the tenor of this psalm, and when I've tried to study to my ability the Hebrew first, and then the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the ancient Hebrew, I think it's actually a third interpretation that is what the original author meant. So what I'm going to read for you now is my paraphrase, right? Not, somebody's, not some great scholar. This is my paraphrase of the ancient languages of what this phrase is saying. It's saying this. In this moment now, God... 
You continue to set a table before my face opposite the ones who are afflicting me. The language here is actually really clear. It, well, I won't get into the nerdy part of it. It's saying you are preparing a table right now. You've already started. It's not like, oh, someday he's going to set a table. No, it's at this moment right now. And in the Hebrew, it's literally you set it before my face. Like the psalmist is like, in the midst of all this, I can see it. Even with that, that I can see it. I can see this table. You've set it before me right opposite the ones who are afflicting me. So this is less about hating your enemies and more about acknowledging I have enemies, I have adversaries, I have afflictions that are afflicting me. And while all these things are afflicting me, God, you're doing the exact opposite opposite, you're setting a table for me, a table of welcome. You're being a gracious host to me, even when all this other stuff is happening. So let me show you an example of this interpretation of the scripture, setting a table in the presence of my enemies. Now, some of you have seen this before because I show it often because this image is core to my faith. It's core to my being. These people have been afflicted by their adversary, the Nazis bombed this church in England, reducing it and much of its former glory to rubble. But rather than being controlled by that, rather than being broken and despairing, rather than seeking revenge and saying, oh, the, the, the enemy's gotten their final say and giving up or just like, we're going to just go nuts. These believers gather in the rubble to worship God anyway. Because the, phil the physical building is broke, but the table of God is not. The physical table is broke, but their spirit is not. In other words, you prepare a table before me not to spite my enemy, but despite my enemy. It's both and. Both I have real troubles and adversaries in the world, and your table is here as well, a light shining in the darkness. This light shining in the darkness. So I want you to take a moment. I want you to think about all the stuff that's going on in your life, at home, at work, with your family. I want you to think about all the stuff you're seeing on TV right now, all the events it's all real. And then I want you to imagine that God is moving a table right into the middle of it. And he set it for you. This table, this table of welcome, this table is a table with a view. I love this image. Let's go to the next slide. I love this image because if you look carefully, you can see the mountains beyond the sea. So here's the table, close and intimate, but it's got a view of the far shore. This is a table with a view. The Lord's table is a table with a view. We have this intimate table of the Lord here and now, but we can catch glimpses of the bigger story through it. We catch a glimpse of the heavenly realm in the distance. This life we live in the present tense is always being lived in the context of that bigger picture with the heavenly realm in the backdrop. It's all connected. The scriptures help me understand how our little lives fit into this much bigger story that God is telling so in the middle of everyday life, when we are surrounded by the wreckage of broken dreams and broken lives, where we are afflicted, where we see other people afflicted, there's something that we have to keep returning our eyes to. It's this table. You see, there is a table. A table where we can find peace and strength it's a table where we encounter God's word and, and we encounter God's wisdom and we encounter God's welcome. We can experience wonder here because we're talking about how our little lives are connected to the supernatural, connected to the divine. And when we really understand it, it compels us to worship. It is the table of the Lord. So why should you still go on 
when you're wrestling with depression and doubt and they're gnawing away at your confidence because the Lord has set a table right in the middle of it. Why should we go on? Out into the world in mission, when it seems so useless, when the world seems so big and so broken and our efforts seem so small, why? Because the Lord has set a table right in the middle of it. Why should we continue to talk about Jesus and try and encourage people to enter into the beautiful gift of his lordship in their life when there's so much noise, so much propaganda, so many talking heads out because the table has been set in the middle of it. The table is here. Where is the table of the Lord in your life right now? Let me explain. If we say, okay, well, what is the table of the Lord in my life? Well, foundationally, what we mean is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. He did the last supper. He did the last table. We're about to share the last table, the last supper, the Lord's table together. Primarily, first, fundamentally, it means that. That he has removed my sin, removed my shame, given me a brand new start. He has redeemed me. He has ransomed me. He has welcomed me stupid me into the household of God. It means that, but we sing here about Jesus, come thou fount of every blessing. And so I think every blessing in my life comes out of this foundational table. So there are blessings from the Lord. There are tables of blessing in the world all around me. So this morning, as you look at your own life, as you look at all the stuff going on, and maybe a lot of it is messed up and dark, can you see, but that's a table of blessing. Maybe you have one relationship with a friend or or someone in your family, and you're like, that is a table of blessing in my life. Maybe it's a book. You know, you're reading this book, and it's just, that is the Lord's table of blessing in my life. Maybe it's a piece of music. Man, you guys, that was a table of blessing for me. That was amazing in my life. Maybe it's being out, you know, in the Wissahickon and looking at this beautiful nature. Like, it's a table of blessing. God sets these tables in the middle of life. All of that mess, and yet still this. And it's Jesus Christ himself who stands as host Waiting, 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 saying, come, come, come and know hope, come and know me, come and know a love that is so great that neither height nor depth nor anything in creation is able to ever pull you out of it, come. Let us pray. Oh Lord, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, in the presence of my afflictions, and you gladly welcome me to it. You are the God who serves, you are the God who saves. You are my good shepherd. Amen. Thanks for joining us today as we strive to think carefully about our faith. You can help keep this ministry on the air by making a donation at leverington.org. For now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. We'll see you next time.